For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Amen. Amen. The word judgment carries a lot of baggage for me. And something tells me that I am not alone in that. It's a term that for me has at times evoked fear and still does sometimes. Frustration, a sense of powerlessness. It's a word that has made God feel distant, calculating, ominous. I think the church on earth for much of its history has struggled with how to steward this word well. Um, and I don't think we've always carried the responsibility of that word very well. If you spend any time in scripture, any time at all, you're ambushed pretty quickly by the mention of judgment. It's everywhere. And the thing with us Episcopalians is that we read a lot of scripture when we worship. So judgment comes up a lot. So hear this picture of judgment that our gospel gives us today. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world. God's light has come to us. This is the judgment. It seems that when I think of God's character, I like to parcel out God's judgment as something that's sort of held at bay from God's brilliance or God's beauty. Um, in the past couple years, I've leaned into that brilliance and beauty part. I guess maybe I felt like I'd already spent enough time wrestling with, with judgment before I became an Episcopalian. I've gotten better about approaching the judgment of God. It, it does come up a lot at seminary as well. And, you know, admittedly being academic about things allows us to be impassive in a way sometimes that kind of, it, it's almost like you're wearing like a hazmat suit, like when you approach like a sensitive topic, right? It's like, you can like intellectualize it and we don't have to like. Um, and then there's also the fact too that there is so much evil in the world. And I do believe in a God who in their goodness and love, delivers from evil and despises oppression. So I think that necessitates that I continue to believe in judgment. So taking the academic approach has helped and looking at judgment in a way that um, focuses on how other people deserve God's judgment is a nice way to distance ourselves <laughs> From the object of, from being the object of God's disapproval. The problem is that this is avoidant behavior. And what we're avoiding, or at least what I'm avoiding, is the fact that God isn't an either or God. I wanted to focus less on the judgmental part of God, but God is not a God that exists in pieces. God is integrated. God may seem paradoxical and be paradoxical to us in our limited wisdom, but internally, within God's self, God is actually not dissonant, I don't think. God's love and judgment somehow within God are not at odds with each other in the same way that they might be within me. Um, to imagine this better, I want you to think, look at the person next to you or across from you, someone around you, and imagine that all of a sudden, in a moment, they are able to see everything that you've ever done. Everything that you've ever said behind someone's back, even every thought that you have ever had about another person. Imagine that they had access to all of it and you were powerless to gatekeep what they could perceive. What would you feel? Would you be proud of everything that they saw? Would there be a difference between how you hope they perceive you now and how they would be able to perceive you after seeing all of those ins and outs of your life? I know that for me there would be a difference. 
Um, imagine now that all of a sudden you can also see everything about them. If we're being honest, I feel like this would probably make me feel better. It might be somewhat equalizing. I might kind of be like, well, you can see how, I, how messed up I am, but you're not so tidy yourself either. It might be comforting. But God, here's the thing, God beholds all of us now. God sees us as we are. God sees all of those ins and outs. Think about that day when we will also look into God's eye. We will look into the face of the one who knows all and sees all. On that day, God will continue to know every part of us, but on that day, we will also come to behold and finally know the fullness of God. And it will not be like that second part of the neighbor in the pew next to you scenario. It will not be equalizing. We will not just behold God. We will also behold the great distance that exists between us and God's utter perfection. In the gospel we read once again, and this is the judgment that the light has come into the world, which would seem to suggest that the brilliance of God is not in and of itself judgmental, I think, but rather it is the light's coming. The light's coming across that distance, God's radiance approaching us. That is judgment. What I found is that that fear and that frustration and that sense of powerlessness I mentioned at the beginning actually doesn't resolve itself. I'm sorry if you thought that's the direction that this sermon was taking. I also thought that that was the direction this sermon was taking when I started writing it. Um, but as we worship God and put our minds on holiness, we realize the things in our lives that are not brilliant. God, as I hope, as I hope we all learn, and my, myself especially, I hope we learn more each time we pray or commune or hear the word of God proclaimed. I hope we learn more that God is brilliant. What will it be like to stand in the fullness of God's perfection? I wonder, in addition <clears throat> to my wonder and elation, I wonder if I'll also feel grief when my most shameful moments and my most careless words and my most bitter thoughts are laid before my eyes at the feet of the one who knit me together in my mother's womb. How will I be able to bear how great a difference there is between the self I have claimed to be and the possibility that lay in the perfect imagination of my maker? Exposed to the full beauty of God's perfection, there will be things that we have placed value in, things that we cling to as part of ourself that will be blown away like chaff. As we gaze into the face of God and behold the perfect imagination of God, we will witness our own recreation. Any distance that remains between us and God's perfect desire for us will be closed in an instant. The closing of that distance is what we will experience as judgment. That's a lot to take in. Here's the thing, though, that I think we often lose sight of. I think we lose sight of the sweetness and the goodness and the loveliness of God and who God is and all that God desires for us. When we speak of God's holiness and God's perfection and the stripping away of anything that God does not desire for us, all that remains will be loveliness and kindness and warmth. All that will remain is God's imagination, God's vision for us. 
And the things that will be stripped away, hard as that may be, are the things that make us miserable, the things that we cling to because we fail to realize or refuse to accept that they make us miserable. Sometimes I, I hear people in our society, especially in my generation, talking about this, this search for authenticity. I think of that day of judgment as the day of authenticity. It's the day when all of that tension within us will be resolved. We will be, we will be true. We will be truth. We work with God to live that image now. But it is God who makes us pure. For by grace you have been saved through faith, Paul writes. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us. Lent is a call to live into that making, um, that remaking. I think of it as part of our first making to reflect the brilliance of God and the chasm between us and that pure holiness. Excuse me, daylight savings is hard on the body. (laughs) We're Christians and it's a secular observance. I think we should reflect on that. Giving up comforts that make our fragility and our mortality easier to forget is one way that we enter into this process, or I guess lend ourselves to this process of being made holy, and also letting our shameful moments sit in the light by way of confession is a really great way to do this as well. And there's a sort of grieving that goes along with all of this, and we call it lament. But there is also a victory in it. In the reflection, the sorting out of ourselves, the prioritizing, the spiritual internal decluttering that, takes way, that makes way for a more integrated self and makes us more loving, sensitive, and engaged neighbors. This is God's mysterious working. What was our destruction and our grief God raises up and turns into a banner of his grace. In his rich mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive with Christ. As the serpent is raised on the pole above the parched earth of the wilderness, and death is raised up upon the cross above the place of the skull, so is our weakness raised up into a sign of God's victory. Let them offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving and tell of his acts with shouts of joy, writes the psalmist. I think we could say God is judgmental, but I think a more apt way of putting it is to say that God is abundantly judicious. Amen.